Well, good morning, everybody. Pastor Allen here. Very glad to be with you this morning. A special word of welcome to everybody at Clemens Campus, uh, everybody at Union Cross Campus at the Ascent, as well as folks down at Lake Norman. Are you ready for some good news? If you ever come to a time when you feel like you had accomplished so much and the victory had been won, only to find there was more ahead of you, that's not the time for despair. It's the time for joy. Because it means that there's more that God has for you to do. Today we come in the narrative of this miracle man, Elijah, to a shockingly honest text about the great prophet who, after his great victory at Mount Carmel, becomes quite depressed. It is in 1 Kings, it is in chapter 19, and uh, we pick up reading at verse 1. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. And he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It's enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a, at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and he drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. Well, I'm nearby pulling for my Baylor Bears basketball team. They're struggling this year. Uh, not sure if they're going to make the NCAA playoffs. And they're fighting for their chance to make it to the big dance. And uh, Monday night, they had one of those must-win games. They were playing at Texas, and Texas is quite beatable. Uh, they need to win uh, at least several more of their conference games. And I was uh, in the car and listening to the game on the radio. And for most of the game, the Bears were in the lead. Not by a lot, never got up by 10 or 15, so maybe got by nine points, but most of the game leading by four or five, even down to the very end of the game. They had led. I think the entire game, starting from about the three-minute mark in the first half, led the whole game. looked like they were going to get the much-needed victory on the road. But uh, at the very end, surprisingly, Texas, who had been missing so many of their shots, nailed four out of their last five field goals. And at the very end, hit a key three-pointer. And next thing you know, the buzzer sounded overtime <laughs> you know that feeling sometimes that comes in life like you feel like you've won it you've run the race and then somebody just moved the finish line on you ever had those times where life feels like it's gone into overtime you thought you'd won you, you, the Baylor Bears surely had already begun to think about the little victory dance in the locker room, the happy ride back to Waco on the bus, and their schedule ahead of them. They'd probably begun to think about how their chances of making the NCAA tournament had increased because this game looked like it was in the bag. And all of a sudden, instead, they have to huddle up and get ready to go out and play five more minutes when they're already tired and several are already in foul trouble. You know what I'm talking about? Where you think you did it and you raised your kids and then your daughter calls you and tells you that she's having struggles with her husband and she needs you to help. Overtime. You've You've been through all the chemo treatments and the initial scans look good and the doctor comes and says, but there's one area of concern. I think we should do radiation as well. Or you're a business person and you landed the big deal and you're only six months into it 
and a competitor you find out has approached your big client with a sweet offer over time. I'm talking about the times in life that can be so especially difficult because although you have accomplished a great victory or seen a dream fulfilled or reached a mountaintop, there seems to always be a voice that comes and tries to shame you in the midst of that saying, but you're still not enough. And we come to this uh, breathtakingly honest narrative about one of the greatest men of God in the Old Testament, the miracle man Elijah, whose life points us in so many ways to Jesus, uh, the Savior, who himself was tired, alone in a wilderness, and an angel came and ministered to him as well. I want to just walk through this story with you and see the dynamics that Elijah was experiencing and see the incredible mercies of God and take away for our own lives some prophetically powerful truths that might lift the discouraged and surely will plant hope in every Christian heart. It started with this. Ahab, verse 1, told Jezebel all that Elijah, all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Elijah had been miraculously fed by ravens. He had prayed for there to be no rain. He had uh, been used by God to raise a boy back to life. He was being used by God in such extraordinary ways. And then in 1 Kings 18, this incredible showdown at Mount Carmel where God comes down upon Elijah's asking him to and consumes an altar that had been wet three times, consumes it with fire, proves himself to be God, and all of the 450 prophets of Baal who had been financed by Jezebel, all of them were defeated. This was no small victory. This was a cosmic victory. It was no hanging chad victory over a close election as to who is the real God. It was a mandate. It was proof positive that God and God alone is the one true living Lord of all. And you would think that the king of Israel, Ahab, would go back to his pagan wife, Jezebel, and say to her, Honey, I have seen something that has blown my mind. It changes everything. I know that you love to worship your Baal, and I know you like your pagan deities and Asherah poles and fertility rites. I know that you have all of that pagan history. But, honey, I need to tell you something that I just saw with my own eyes. I need to tell you that I saw God. I'm talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob come down in fire upon an altar miraculously because Elijah, the prophet of God, had spoken this word and God honored it. He needed to come home and say, Jezebel, it's time to put away all of our idols. I'm taking them off the shelf. Honey, you need to follow me on this. We have got to change everything. There's one true living God. But instead, this mouse of a king came to his queen more with a whimper. And I hear the text saying it like this, that he just told her with a whine, let me tell you everything that Elijah has done. Instead of leading her to change the mouse whimpers to his woman, and he gave the bad news of the defeat of the prophets of Baal without giving the good news of the glorious power of Yahweh. And then, verse 2, Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, the text says, saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them, this time tomorrow. The voice of Jezebel. You see, when sin entered the world, when Adam and Eve ate 
the forbidden fruit, disobeyed God, and brought sin into what had been paradise. As soon as the sin and guilt came into the world, as soon as that happened, shame also came. Uh, the sin was the disobedience. The shame was a voice that slithered in and says, now look at you. Now that you've messed up, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You ought to cover yourself. You ought to, you ought to think about how doomed you really are because you are fatally flawed now. You don't measure up, and you're not going to measure up. That's what the voice of shame says. And so when we hear it, we tend to cover ourselves up. There are so many ways that we try to pretend, pretend to be what we are not. Um, a substance might help you mask and cover up your shame for an evening. A glance at something on the internet might cause you to be distracted from your shame for a little bit. And there is another avenue, and this was probably more my pathway, and that is that if the voice says you're not good enough as you are, then just perform better, work harder, and do more until you can be so perfect that then you'll feel okay about yourself. And the problem is that no matter how much you accomplish, no matter what pinnacle you reach in your attempt to answer the voice of shame, there still will come the voice of a Jezebel. You could become the president of the PTA or the president of the bank or the president of the United States, and the voice will still be there. It's interesting that Elijah could have this kind of depressive moment in his life after such a big victory it's it's sort of the opposite of the famous old wide world of sports you know the thrill of victory the agony of defeat this is like the agony of victory i think this can happen where you have accomplished so much that there's a unique shame voice that can say now look at you you did what you always dreamt of doing and it's still not enough. There's still some other nagging, gnawing voice that says, I'm going to get you still. Jezebel lived by vows. I'll do this or else may the gods deal with me ever so severely. Lived by a hellish bent. She was demonic. She was antichrist she was the voice of shame and her conscience was seared there was no stopping she just was bent on this she operated by fear she eats fear she sleeps fear and she dispenses fear and she's ready to terrorize the prophet of god and this is where we say yes but this is elijah he's the man of god he's the prophet of the Most High God. He's the one who just had this incredible victory at Mount Carmel. He's been used by God to raise people from the dead. Elijah just swat the fly. She's a flea. She's nothing. She's one woman. You just took down 450 prophets of paganism. What does one pagan queen who's afraid and, 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 and demonized, what has she got against you, Elijah? We want to say that's what will happen. He'll just swat it away. He'll move on. He'll laugh. He'll mock her pagan deities. He'll, he'll, he'll do what he did at Mount Carmel. And instead, isn't it shocking? Verse 3, then he was afraid and he arose and he ran for his life. Come on, Elijah, forget her. Let her bluster. Dismiss her. My, maybe you need a little vacation. Go down to the Dead Sea. Get a little sun, a little rest. Float in the water. You'll be all right. But instead, this prophet, who James said is the model of miraculous prayer, utters no prayer, 
claims no scripture, consults no counselor, and feels all of his faith drain out of him. And he runs for his life. Instead of taking his shame and exhaustion to God in these moments, Elijah decides to try to bear it alone. He was afraid, arose, ran for his life. Verse 3, the end of it. And he left his servant there. It's so diabolical that when we most need to be with people, we least want to be with people. One of the strangest things. When we're hurting and we most need real friendship is when we most want to hide. And that's exactly what Elijah does. And author Gordon Dalby's words, the effort to hide the truth of your inadequacy and bear your shame consumes you and sabotages your destiny. When all your energies focus on on an enemy, you have no energy or vision left to discern and fulfill your calling in life. The enemy thereby begins to define you. Hell, therefore, could aptly be described as trying to bear your own shame. It's living a lie, forever sandbagging against the rising tide of truth and eternally exhausting distraction from your holy destiny. He left his servant, and this is what we read at verses 4 and 5. But he himself, Elijah, went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It's enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I'm no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. What's going on here? It's the voice of shame that says, You gave it your best, and it wasn't enough. You gave it your all, but it's not good enough. It's almost like to say, if you hadn't tried hard, then you could excuse it by saying, well, I didn't really give it my all. But you gave it your all. You reached the mountaintop, and now there's a voice saying that it's not enough. Now there's another voice saying that you still have more to do, that there's still something to be done. And it feels like a mountain. It's important to stop here and just let this sink in. There is no accomplishment that's going to set you free. There is no performance that is going to give you peace. There is no level of spiritual maturity or authority that you manifest that is ever going to excuse you in this world from the reality of a spiritual battle. There is no such thing as a day where it's okay to take off the armor of God. When the devil tempted Jesus, it says that then he left him and waited for an opportune moment. And you would think that those opportune moments are always when you've failed or when you're at the low ebb. But what this text tells us is that sometimes the opportune moment is when you have succeeded. You'll never prove yourself to everybody to an extent that you'll be so popular that there won't be someone who will criticize you. The way out is not through a greater and greater Mount Carmel. The way out is the comfort and nourishment and fellowship of God. Elijah's depressed. All the symptoms are there. These are the classic symptoms that are described in medical journals. Loss of interest and normal activity, a smothering sadness, a complete loss of energy, thoughts of suicide or thoughts of death, loss of appetite, desire to be alone, sleeping in the middle of the day, a feeling of worthlessness. I'm no better than my father's. I should say that um, it's, it's important to know this, that depression is considered by the medical community to be the most treatable 
form of all mental disorders, and yet it's the least treated. Just under 7% estimated of American adults, over 16 million, struggle with depression, and yet only a third seek treatment. Is it spiritual? Is it psychological? Is it physical? The answer is yes to all of that. Things spiritually affect us and affect our, our mind, and our mind affects us physiologically. And the things that are going on in you physiologically, uh, the chemical balances within you physiologically are affecting your mind. We are spirit, soul, and body, and so we must be treated as such. So I just want to say this, anyone that's struggling with depression, please get treatment for this. There's not a stigma about getting medical treatment for depression. Every good gift comes from God. It doesn't mean that you're going to be stuck on some bad medication all your life. It doesn't mean that there's some stigma or some major thing that's wrong with you. You're an inferior Christian or something like that. There are so many complex ways that we wind up being in a depressed condition the number one thing I have to say is that it is something God can change in your life and address it spiritually and psychologically and physically. In his profound TED Talk on the subject, New York Times columnist and best-selling author Andrew Solomon candidly described the depression that he experienced by saying, the opposite of depression is not happiness, it is vitality. Sometimes you're happy, sometimes you're sad. But what depression is, is really a loss of all vitality. He goes on to explain that when he was depressed, the very thought of just getting up and getting dressed and getting food out and then having to chew the food and swallow it felt exhausting. It is, Solomon said, not like a gray veil through which you see everything. But instead, he said, depression is more like the veil of happiness through which you once saw the world has been taken away. And now you look and think this is the way the world really is. It, it really, and in some ways, it boils down to what is real. Um, and, and, and we are designed, beloved, to live by, by faith, not by fear. We're designed to live and have vitality because of hope, of what is possible. And depression is the absence of such faith or such hope. You know, what's interesting, in some ways, <laughs> depressed people, in some ways, at one level, are more in touch with reality than those that are not depressed. There was a classic study in the 70s that was done in which participants were just given a button and they had a green light and they were supposed to press the button and determine how much... Uh, they're trying to control this green light coming on. Afterwards, when they interviewed, the depressed persons who were in the study came very close to being 100% accurate of describing how much control they really had over that green light coming on through the button. But the non-depressed persons tended to think they had a lot more influence over the green light coming on than they actually did. A, a later study, similar, took participants and had them play a little video game in which they're, they're shooting at little monsters coming up on the screen. And afterwards, when they interviewed the depressed persons who had played the game, they were amazingly accurate when asked the question, how many of those little monsters did you kill while you were playing? They came within just uh, one or two percentage points of being exactly accurate. But the non-depressed persons, listen to this, were, were wrong. They, were, they, they reported 15 to 20 times more monsters killed than what they'd actually killed, <laughs> which is a very interesting thing. It means that in some ways that depressed people are looking at one level of reality more realistically than non-depressed persons. That is another way of putting this, is that non-depressed persons, people who have a lot of vitality, are actually looking at the world through a lens that sees something that is possible that may not yet line up with just the reality that you see with your eyes. And the reason this is important for us is that there's a word for that, faith. There's, a, there's another word that's very akin to that, hope. 
It is when you have a sense that something can be better than what it is now so that what you're actually living by is something that is maybe better than what you could see at any given moment just in the natural. Um, In other words, compare Elijah in chapter 18 where he defeats 450 prophets of Baal. Here is Elijah and he is alone and he has no other prophets with him and he has nothing but the word of God that has told him to set up this showdown. But there are 450 prophets who are ready to kill him. There is Jezebel who is financing the prophets. There's Ahab who is against him. In many ways, what you have to say is that the predicament in chapter 18 was a far, far worse predicament than what he was in in chapter 19, right? But in fact of matter, in chapter 18, you don't hear Elijah saying, oh, I'm doomed, I'm up against 450 prophets of Baal. You see, it's a strange thing. To be not depressed means that you are in a sense living by a hope and a faith that has found a higher reality than the natural reality. Because in the natural scheme of things, in the circumstances he, is, he was in in chapter 18, he was in a terrible hot mess. There is something powerful for us here that what happened with Elijah was not a change of circumstances that left him in a predicament to be depressed, but it was the draining of faith and hope He lost sight of the word of the Lord and instead he had the sound of the word of Jezebel running around in his mind. It's like someone reminded me when we were kids and we had the little singles that would come out in little 45s on the turntable and on one side there's a really great hit song and on the other side it's a song you don't even like. And... This person said, it's an image that she got of like, if the song is playing the wrong song and it's going over and over and over, there's no way out of this except turn it over and play the different song. A whole different song started going through Elijah's mind. Psychologists would point to several realities you can see that are manifest in Elijah, not to not to over psychoanalyze poor Elijah here, but this is what was happening. The first is called selective abstraction. And that is where there's a tendency to focus on a single negative event or condition to the exclusion of others. It's where a person gets preoccupied with something negative. So uh, selective abstraction might cause a person to be a woman to be preoccupied that she's not in a relationship at that moment. And if you get preoccupied with that, you can forget that you have a, a good family and lots of friends because you're just focusing on this one negative thing. Um, at any given point in your life, there is something negative that will be going on. But what happens when our minds start getting locked into the negative message, it's a cycle. And we're prone towards this. The, the biblical story of the people of God is just littered with examples of this where there's a red sea that opens a miracle that you'd think you could never forget and then one long weekend later when it's a little dry and thirsty the people start murmuring as if they don't even remember the miracle God had just accomplished we tend to forget our God moments rather than rehearse them if ever there was a time that Elijah needed to say to himself and to his servant, we're tired and Jezebel's after us and she is formidable, but let's take a few moments and talk about what God did at Mount Carmel. Wasn't that something? Can I tell you a testimony? Can I talk to you about what God's done in my life? When you start saying that and you start thinking like that, it activates your mind and your spirit lines up with this to see what is possible. How you remember yesterday is going to determine how you live tomorrow. Another thing you see going on here psychologically I think with Elijah is what the psychologists call dichotomous thinking. Dichotomous thinking. Um, this is all or none thinking. This is, uh, this is something that uh, mental health care providers have noticed amongst those that are hospitalized with depression is that they'll often say things like if he doesn't come see me today that means he doesn't love me. When in reality it just means that 
No, he had a lot of things on his plate that day, and he'll come the next day. Dichotomous thinking, if you had a marital spat, you go to an all or none, black or white. Well, I thought we were good for each other, but obviously we're not. We, we, we're obviously we're not even right for each other. No, we just, had a, we just had a regular old marital spat that everybody has. Uh, dichotomous thing, he says, well, I failed that chemistry class, so I might as well drop out of school. Um, a man who struggles with dichotomous thinking might start a new job, and at first he would tell you it's fantastic. Job is fantastic. Coworkers are wonderful. Got the greatest boss in the world. Three months later, gets criticized for something that he didn't do exactly right, and so now instead of everything's wonderful, everything's horrible. Obviously, this is the worst job in the world. I shouldn't have ever taken it. Boss is terrible. Coworkers are awful. Life's not dichotomous. Uh, life's not like that. Here, here's another thing that psychologists point to that often happens in the depressed person. Catastrophic thinking. This is what happens with Elijah. It exaggerates the possible consequences of an event or a situation. My knee hurts. Oh no, if my knee hurts, it's going to be bad. I'm going to wind up in a wheelchair. I'll wind up in a wheelchair. I won't be able to work. I won't be able to pay the bills. I'll be on the street. No, you just your knee's hurting right now. <laughs> catastrophic thing it carries things out to some negative extreme a woman calls her husband he doesn't answer she calls again he doesn't answer she's been thinking maybe he's been acting a little odd lately he must be having an affair no no his battery had just gone out on his phone you don't carry it too far elijah had begun to think all or none either i'm always going to be on the mountaintop or else i'm just going to have to get under a broom tree no elijah that's not it well, I'm just done. I'm no better than my father's. I'm, I'm, no, I'm just as much a failure as everybody else. Look at this. And so I might as well die. He is fearful and he's depressed. And you might think that God would come down with some heavy-handed judgment on his prophet. He might come down and bully him back into his senses. Snap out of it. You're the man of God. Don't you know what you're doing? You're representing me, and here you are sitting under a broom tree. Pull yourself up. It never works with a depressed person. Instead, verse 5, Behold, an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. The power of touch. To a man who wanted to be alone, God refused to leave him isolated. This is our God. We who wanted to just get away from God, instead received him and the word became flesh. He's a God who draws near. You need connection. And this is who God is. You might want him to take your Jezebel away. You might want him just to remove your thorn. You might want him just change your circumstances. But let me tell you what God normally does. He doesn't fix you like you want to fix from a substance. He doesn't snap everything into place like you want to get it some quick shortcut to glory. He comes and he fellowships with you. He comforts you. He promised to never leave you comfortless. He didn't promise you that you wouldn't have grief, but he promised he'd never leave you alone. And then he said, verse 5, arise and eat. Interesting. Get up and eat. It was a command. Arise and eat. Every command of God has a promise in it. So if he says, get up and eat, it must mean that there's a reason for you to have nourishment that you're not going to die after all. Because dying people don't need to eat. Only alive people do. And if you're going to be nourished and you're going to be alive, there must be a reason that God wants you to stay alive. Feed on this, God says. He is to us the true manna. His word is grace to us. Arise and eat it. Feed on God's grace. And verse 7, the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him. Do you love the patience and the perseverance of God of the times where God has reached out to you and you didn't say yes? And 
he should have just abandoned you then, but he didn't. He pursues you. He woos you. He loves you. He persists. He's at his most patient when we are at our worst and there's a second touch and there's a second sound of the voice of the Lord. I love in the story of Jonah after he had abandoned God, run with all of his fury as far as he knew to get away from God and abandoned his prophetic calling and the text said after he'd been swallowed up by a whale, the text said and the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable and he has not given up on you and he will not give up on you no matter how much you have given up on him. At verse 7, arise and eat for the journey is too great for you. The journey is too great for you. But not for God. The cliche is correct. Life is a journey, not a destination. And God's got more for you. I love the old story of a seminarian who would walk around and tell all of these fellow students, I will go far in the ministry. I will go far in the ministry. I will go far in the ministry. Until finally, someone came and asked him, what's it with you always saying this? Are you just arrogant? Or do you really think that you're going to go some great distance in the ministry more than other people? He said, I don't know. He said, I'm just saying, all my professors always tell me, they say, you've got a long way to go. <laughs> Let me tell you some good news. <laughs> to have a long way to go means that you've got to go far. The greatest news that any depressed or discouraged person could ever hear from God is summed up in this command, arise and eat for the journey is too great for you. Because in it is the promise that there's nourishment, there's daily grace, my grace will be sufficient for you and I'm going to be with you, says the Lord. But what it also means is that there's still a far, far way for you to go. There is more for you to do. There is a mission that is still ahead of you. You have been through some ups. You have been through some downs. You have reached some pinnacles and you have come into a valley. But I'm telling you, Elijah, that there is still a great journey that is in front of you. And the sound of the hope of the gospel, the sound of the encouragement of an angel's voice that is sharing and caring, at the very moment Elijah receives this and he takes the nourishment, we are told that he rises up and he travels 40 days. He goes a long way because you know what's still in front of him? A still small voice that will speak to him. There's intimacy with God that's still in front of him. There is still the passing of a mantle to a son in the spirit, Elisha, who will receive a double portion of his spirit. And there is still a whirlwind and a chariot of fire and an ascension into heaven. And there is still going to be on the pages of the New Testament Elijah returning and shimmering on the Mount of Transfiguration next to Jesus. The journey indeed was still great before Elijah and beloved no matter how discouraged you are hear the word of the Lord for you there is still a great journey that is in front of you. It is not by your might it is not by your power but by the Spirit of the Lord. It is not by your cleverness it is not by your accomplishments. It is by the presence of God. And there is nourishment that is available in His grace. Arise and eat. Arise and be nourished in the grace of God. Because God still has great things for you. And that's the gospel. Oh, I know, you're wondering about my Baylor Bears. <laughs> they didn't win in overtime. They won in double overtime, and that's the gospel. <laughs>